Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual program at the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Molly Wood. I'm a host and senior editor for Marketplace Tech on National Public Radio, and I will be moderating today's program. We would, of course, like to thank our members, donors, and supporters for making this and all other programs possible. We're grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. Today, I am pleased to be joined by Jacob Goldstein, NPR correspondent and author of the new book, Money, The True Story of a Made-Up Thing. Jacob co-hosts the NPR podcast, Planet Money, a show that candidly explains the theoretical financial concepts moving our economy. In Money, Jacob seeks to answer the most basic question that many think we already have the answer to. Is money real? Through a detailed history of money and its purpose, he traces the irreverent concept of capital and its evolution over time, from the rise of coins in ancient Greece to the emergence of shadow banking in the 21st century. Money follows the stories of the unorthodox leaders who first saw money as a viable system to exchange goods. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour. We're going all the way back to ancient Greece after all. And I wanna ask uh, your questions too. So if you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Jacob Goldstein, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So I'm gonna start with some overall questions before we dig deep into the history because I have a lot of pages here on that. I'm ready. Because, wow. Great. Why did you wanna write this book? Well, um... So I was an English major in college. I never studied economics. I was like a little bit wary of money in that kind of, you know, classic center left way, right? Like nice to have, but I don't want to be too interested in it because somehow that seems kind of bad and scary. Uh, but it was, the, it was the financial crisis in 2008. I was working at the Wall Street Journal. I was a reporter. I was covering healthcare. I didn't know that much about finance. And I, I went out to dinner with my aunt, who was like a very successful businesswoman. We're at this nice restaurant in Manhattan. And, um, you know, trillions of dollars in wealth had just sort of vanished overnight in a week, two weeks from the stock market, from real estate. And I asked her this sort of big, dumb question, basically, which was, where did the money go? Like, what happened to those trillions of dollars? And she said, you know, like, look, money is fiction. It was never there in the first place. And that was like sort of a crack of light for me, you know, uh, being this person who always been kind of wary of money, realizing that money was this like stranger, more interesting thing that I thought. And I went off and worked at Planet Money and learned more and wrote the book. You, I, I want to tell you now, for those of you who are watching and not listening to this program, that Jacob warned me that he was likely to knock over his microphone with wild gesticulating, and it's already starting. Almost. I couldn't be more delighted. <laughs> um. So you have this, this tale of the shared fiction and the kind of like increasing complexities that get layered on as it wreaks unintended consequences. Is there a broader point that you want people to take away from this book? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the thing that I, that I have learned basically and that I learned writing the book is, you know, it feels like money is doesn't quite feel like money is like subject to the laws of nature or physics, but it almost feels like that. You know, it feels like money is this solid, absolute thing that exists in the world and we sort of serve at its pleasure. But the thing I realized in putting the book together is like, that is absolutely not true, right? Money is a thing people not only made up, but have made up again and again in very different ways. So money is this very changeable thing that is the product of a bunch of choices we make as, as people, as countries. And it often doesn't feel like it's a set of choices. So recognizing that, I think, is the big takeaway from the book. Recognizing that we feel like it's this fixed, the way the relationship we have with money in our particular timeline is this fixed thing that could never possibly change because this is just like how it is and that's it. Recognizing that it's not that. Recognizing right. that recognizing we can that change that. it. Recognizing right. that money is a set of choices and we can choose something different if we want. And people have chosen different things in the past and will choose different things in the future. Let's go through on the on the kind of like road to drawing some of these bigger conclusions, some of the great stories that are, are in this book. I mean, it is just so readable and super interesting. For example, that China essentially invented paper money uh, under the Mongols and it was super successful and brought a lot of people into economic prosperity and then went away for like a thousand years. Spoiler alert. Yes. So, uh, yes. Yeah. So 
So that story, it starts a little bit before the Mongols show up in China. It starts around the year uh, 1000 um, in the province of Sichuan where they happen to use iron coins. In most of China at this point, they use bronze coins. And this is, you know, this is the era when the value of a coin is derived from the value of the metal, right? We're familiar with gold and silver in the West. They use bronze mostly in China. In Sichuan, they used iron. And iron wasn't very valuable, right? Then as now, it's this very abundant metal. And so it was basically crappy money, right? To buy, for example, um, a pound of salt, you needed a pound and a half of iron coins. So it's just a very inconvenient, you know, medium of exchange. And so there is this moment, this like very clear moment of invention just before the year 1000 AD when some merchant in the capital of Sichuan says, okay, people of the city, <laughs> leave your iron coins with me and I'll give you a receipt, like a claim check for your coins. And then people, as you can see this coming, they start using the receipt itself as money. They use the receipt to buy stuff rather than go back and get the coins and take it and buy the stuff. They just give the seller the receipt. And so these paper receipts from a private merchant turn into money. The government sees this, you know, it's a technological innovation, right? This is a time when there's no motorized transport. It's really hard to move metal around. And so uh, paper money spreads widely through China. And it's actually part of this really incredible economic boom, this sort of proto-industrial revolution, this flourishing that I frankly didn't know anything about. I've been covering economics for 10 years. I didn't know about this till I was working on the book, but it's this really incredible period when you have technological innovations and new inventions and this uh, urban cities, you know, cities growing to a million people, which is like 10 times as big as the cities in Europe at the time. And there's a restaurant scene and it's really quite something. And it's, uh, it's you know, market driven, this new uh, technology, paper money is, is part of it. And then, as you said, the Mongols invade. The Mongols like paper money. They uh, have, you know, uh, an empire that spans all of Asia, and they're nomadic. And so they recognize the, the value of this technology. That's a much more efficient way to move essentially value purchasing power around. Uh, at one point, Kublai Khan even goes as far as saying, OK, now it's not a claim check for coins anymore. Now it's just paper, this advance that really won't happen in the West for many hundreds of years. Um, and it, it works for a while. And then another, uh, there's a, a rebellion from China. The, uh, the, what becomes the Ming Dynasty pushes out the Mongols and they are basically reactionaries. They don't like all of this paper money and, and uh, markets and cities. They sort of idealize the self-sufficient agricultural village. And China winds up abandoning paper money altogether, going back to lumps of metal. And this incredible technology disappears from not just China, but the whole world for hundreds of years after that. And you kind of argue that that's a part of why, you know, in our lore, we think the Industrial Revolution came along in a vacuum a little bit, or that, you know, but that China had really been on that road and then fallen behind because money went away? Well, no, I mean, in a sense, the money was more effect than cause, right? The money was part of a, of a broader shift. So what you saw in the, the Song Dynasty in like uh, 1,000, 1,100, when there was this real flourishing was a number of things going together. It was, it was you know, money itself was part of it, but also uh, a real scientific advances and urbanization and, you know, things we think of as, as kind of the modern world in the West was happening then at this time in China. And I think, you know, more broadly, the kind of reactionary, anti-urban, anti-trade, um, uh, uh, shifts from the Ming Dynasty harmed that. And people, in fact, got poorer in China. I mean, one of the really striking lessons to me is, you know, since the Industrial Revolution, there has been consistent uh, growth in wealth. And like, you know, we are concerned sometimes about the distribution of that wealth or about rising inequality. But over even medium amounts of time in the West, in a broad way, standards of living have been rising. But that's not the historical norm. And you can go backwards. You can get poorer for hundreds of years. And that's one of the darker lessons of that period uh, right. in China. So then we fast forward a little bit to England in the 1600s, where like proto-financialization begins. Yes. Tell us about tell us about the goldsmiths. So England in the 1600s is this, you know, brutal place and there's civil war. And uh, there are goldsmiths who, you know, make things out of gold and who have vaults in their shops. 
And so people in this time start storing uh, their gold with the goldsmiths. And this is going to be like echoes of the Sichuan thing. They start getting receipts uh, for their uh, gold and the receipts start circulating as money. So, so far, so similar. And this is in fact, the first paper money in England, as far as I know, they didn't know about the China thing. It's just like, you know, independent evolution. But then they take this next step that is a big deal that uh, didn't really happen in Sichuan in China. And that is this. Um, these goldsmiths start giving people loans and they'll give them loans by giving them one of these receipts for gold, even when they don't have any gold at the goldsmith. So I go to the goldsmith, I say, I want a loan. I don't have any gold. The goldsmith just gives me a claim check for gold, a piece of paper that I can now use as money. And so this is useful to me because I have a loan. It's actually useful to England because they'd had this problem of actually not enough coins, not enough like money stuff circulating. So that's good. But there is this problem that is like embedded in the act of giving me a receipt, a claim check for gold that doesn't exist, right? And that is if everybody with a claim check for gold shows up at the same time, there's not going to be enough gold now, right? And this is uh, the way banks work today, like today we call this fractional reserve banking. And when a bank makes a loan, they uh, credit your account, they put money in the bank for you, but they don't have that money in the vault, right? And it's still true that if everybody uh, with a deposit at the bank goes to the bank and asks for their money back, the bank doesn't have it, right? And it's not because the bank is shady or poorly run or criminal, that's just the way banking works. And so there is this fundamental instability at the heart of banking now, and you see it all the way back in the 1600s with the goldsmiths in England. And indeed there was a run not long after they started doing it because that's just structurally what happens. Right, and I, I actually, although we were moving forward in time, I want to back all the way up because you really start, because this idea of debt is pretty central to the invention of what we now think of as money, right? Like you talk about how there were tributes before there was money and the societies who never invented it, there was still gift giving or there was still some kind of exchange of goods. And it, it doesn't seem like it took that long for this fundamental idea of debt to be introduced. Yeah, I mean, if you, th if you go back to sort of small, you know, kin-based, non-industrial, not that big societies, right? What we might call like a tribal society, small groups of people, um, they were typically driven, and this, you know, we know from anthropologists in the 20th century who went out and, and studied these types of communities, often driven by very strong norms of, of, of reciprocity, rules about when you give gifts, when you get gifts, uh, some of the classics are like if uh, if you're getting married, right? You will very often one, you know, either the bride or the groom will give the family of the of the marriage partner some some gift that is very formalized. You have to give them cattle or some number of cattle or something like that. Murder is another classic. If you kill someone, you have to give their family some set of things, and these rules and norms seem like really where the roots of money are. You know, prescribed rules about what you have to give people in what settings seems like as close as we can come to the real sort of origins of money before there was money. Right. And so then increasingly you have this sort of problem of physicality, which leads to these kind of receipts. And can we just, there are like a couple remarkable examples about Sweden in this book, can you just tell us about Sweden's copper coins around the time that England is starting, the goldsmiths are giving these paper receipts? Yeah, it is right around the same time, maybe a little little earlier even. It's the 1600s, which is more generally this moment when sort of modern financial capitalism is sort of taking steps, baby steps in some places, bigger steps in other places around a kind of Western and uh, Northern Europe. Um, so in Sweden, it's kind of analogous to the Sichuan iron coins thing. What they had a lot of was copper and copper of course is less valuable than silver or gold. So copper coins weren't that valuable. So what that happened with them was they got really big. There were coins that were like the size of a tabletop that weighed like 30 pounds that people carried strapped to their backs. And so perhaps not surprisingly, that was the first place we saw paper money in Europe, right? The Swedes opened a, a, a sort of a state bank, a, a, a cent not really a central bank, they opened a bank, let's say, where you could leave your ridiculous iron coins and get paper money, which must have been like an incredible breakthrough, right? Yeah, possibly physically massive breakthrough. Um, massive breakthrough, okay, so, felt like a million bucks, right? A right. million daily. Off your back. Yeah. Um, so, so at this point we have, you know, we have this kind of idea of trust. We have this idea of a, a stand-in for a physical money. 
Uh, the idea of trust is getting increasingly central. And then it seems like we then get to data, right? We get to John Law and probability introduced into our kind of financial stew. Sure. So, um, yeah, I'm just, John I'm Law, just weaving my own narrative here. I love about it. No, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, so this is the same era. I mean, the, the like late 1600s, early 1700s were a really extraordinary intellectual and sort of financial economic time. And there is this guy named John Law, who again, like, I can't believe I've been working at Planet Money for 10 years and I didn't know about him until I started working on the book because his story is just so extraordinary, right? He's So he's born uh, in Scotland, actually son of a goldsmith, like too perfect, uh, grows up and becomes sort of this rake, goes to London and is like gambling and chasing women. And then he gets in a duel and he kills a guy and he's arrested and convicted of murder and sentenced to death. And then he uh, escapes from jail and flees to Europe. And as you said, probability is this pretty new thing. It's like decades old that it's really been getting going. And he learns probability and gets rich as a gambler. Um, and he is also, as he is doing all of these things, apparently, kind of taking in these uh, economic developments that are happening. Amsterdam, he's in Amsterdam at one point, and they have... Uh, the Dutch East India Company, which is kind of the first multinational with the whole stock market uh, attached to it. Uh, and he's, he sees that. He sees, you know, the Bank of England and England is kind of starting to come along. And he, he realizes paper money. And he, he gets this idea that he's going to take all of these different pieces of, you know, what are going to become modern financial capitalism and put them together and create like a whole economic system for, for a country. Because lots of countries didn't really have this stuff yet. Most didn't. And so he starts sort of going around pitching it like a like an entrepreneur, basically, to different countries. He goes home to Scotland and pitches it, and they don't want it. And he goes, I don't know, to Turin or something. He finally finds a taker in France uh, where the king is a little boy. So France is being run by a, a regent, the Duke of Orleans, Orléans. Um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and the, the regent, uh, like John Law, likes gambling and drinking and, you know, having parties. And so he basically says, yeah, sure, like John Law, go wild. You know, France was totally bankrupt at this time. The previous king had to like melt down his silver candlesticks to make coins, all this. And so John Law creates in just a few years in France, uh, the first modern bank, the first paper money. He gets control of this colonial trading company that controls like half of North America, right? This is before the Louisiana Purchase of so the whole Mississippi Valley, like all the way from whatever, I don't know, Minnesota all the way down. New Orleans is actually named for the regent, New Orleans, uh, the Duke. And, uh, and he has stock. You can buy stock in this trading company. Uh, his bank is now printing the paper money you can use to buy the stock conveniently. And there is this incredible boom in Paris. Uh, the stock price starts going up. Uh, they actually close off a street because everybody's like rushing in to trade the stock. Uh, John Law becomes like one of the richest men in the world. Uh, they invent the word millionaire because everybody's getting so rich, they need a new word to describe how rich everybody is. And then, of course, it all sort of falls apart and comes crashing down. And John Law has to sneak out of Paris in a borrowed carriage chased by a mob and moves to Venice and lives his life out gambling and collecting art. Who yeah. among us cannot tell a very similar story? I mean, it's basically really. my life story in I my know. 20s. And then I tried some <laughs> other things. Then I got into But like John radio. Law, we're sort of redeemed and then maybe not redeemed. No, I don't basically skip... hanging out in Venice making podcasts. Right. It's okay. It's not bad. That's not so bad. No. All right. I'm going to start the fleeing right after this. Okay. Your coach is outside. I don't want to skip. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to skip Amsterdam here because what, what, what do you think it is about this, this period in the 1600s? This is also when, for all intents and purposes, like you said, the, the publicly traded multinational company and the stock market are invented. Yeah, that so that, I mean that is that is basically the Amsterdam story, and they also have this interesting little public bank. So Amsterdam, John Law, after he goes to Amsterdam, writes this book. He goes back to Scotland when he's pitching the Scots on like, let's do this, let's make a modern financial economy. He writes this book, and there's this part that I love where he's like, basically, there's all these reasons that uh, that the Dutch, you know, the Netherlands should be a crappy country. It's in a bad place and they're right next to the Germans and blah, blah, blah. But they're rich because they figured out money. And he's like, on the other hand, Scotland should be a great country. We got good land and we're in a good spot and blah, blah, blah. But we're poor because we're doing money all wrong. Uh, and, and he was 
basically right about that. I mean, you know, the sort of kind of historical shorthand for John Law is that he was uh, a con man, essentially, right? He was like a shady banker with a bunch of lies who blew into France and brought him paper money. And it was all a con. It was all kind of a Ponzi scheme. And of course, it collapsed in the end. But like, I don't think that's true. I mean, his writings on monetary theory are sophisticated and complicated. And like, he definitely got carried away in France and he did bad things, uh, but he wasn't fundamentally wrong, I think. He just sort of had too much power and went a little too wild. I mean, this is, you know, it is a bunch of stories of people who really looked at the world in a different way. Like what kind of brain do you think it takes to look around especially as you get later in the book. And we already have like very well-established what feel like extremely complex, you know, natural order seeming financial systems. What kind of brain does it take to look around and go like, actually we're doing money all wrong. Yeah, like the chutzpah, right? Uh, I don't know. So let's see. I mean, certainly just like smart, right? John Law was clearly like smart, very good at math, understood probability before most people did. Certainly I think uh, uh, risk appetite, right? Like enjoying risk seeking is, it seems like an important characteristic. Uh, and then clearly some kind of independence of mind, right? Uh, which I don't know, it might, you might call it arrogance if you don't like the person, or you might call it, you know, creativity if you like them, but it certainly takes a lot to reject so much, su such a deep seated thing as money, right? Like, in most of these times, there are lots of people who are smart and probably lots of them who are risk seeking, but who basically are living within the monetary world they are living in without questioning it, without saying, wait, we could be doing this entirely differently. And it's that last piece that's the most maybe mysterious, certainly the most interesting. I don't know what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, it also starts to create bubbles. Like, of course, bubbles had, had existed in that time before. But one thing you say in, in the book, and then you also quote Matt Levine, the essence of finance is time travel. So this idea of moving resources from the present into the future and back again, which is partly how John Law gets in trouble, right? And how, how bubbles can tend to get created. Yes. Although I should say, I mean, even the most basic, non-bubbly, boring finance is largely about moving money around in time, right? Like a, the point of having a savings account, the most boring, no interest, federally insured savings account is, I have money, I have the ability to buy stuff now, but I don't wanna buy stuff now, I wanna buy it later, right? And then the most basic uh, boring loan, whatever, a car loan, a mortgage is, I want more money now uh, and I'll pay you back later, right? And so, the, even the most boring kind of finance is this kind of time travel. It's, I have more money than I need now and I'll give it to you until later, or I need some money now and I'll give you back with interest later. Uh, mm -hmm. So it starts there and then, yeah, and then it gets kind of wild or people get uh, a little overexcited or you have too much finance sometimes, you know, like there's this interesting thing where you want like just the right amount of finance. You can actually have too little finance. That was sort of the Great Depression story. It was the story of, of Western Europe before John Law came along, right? In England, before the Goldsmiths started making money, there was just not enough actual money. They needed banks, they needed lending. But then we're more familiar with the too much finance problem, right? Every Too easy to get a loan, too much lending. That's the kind of bubbly world you can get when you have too much. Right. Let's before we get further down the road into bubbles, let's put a fine point on that because we talked about John Law, but not this this kind the the nugget of the really revolutionary idea, which is that in order to have prosperity, you have to create money. I think that's right. And I mean, again, like we are very familiar with the too too much finance, kind of too much money. You know, we may fear inflation, which is in some ways a function of too much money. Uh, but there is this opposite problem that because our world is so financialized, we have kind of forgotten about, which is too little money. Nobody can get a loan. And, you know, one of the interesting things that sort of pro-bank people argue at different points in history is like, if you got rid of banks altogether, rich people would be okay. Like, they already have money. The people who would be really screwed are the people, you know, like, if you, whatever, in the modern version, if you, you know, you get a job. And it's a good job, but in order to get this job, you need a car, but I don't have any money yet, right? I need a little finance as time travel. In order to get the money uh, from my job, I need money now so I can get a car so I can go to my job, right? So the absence of banks 
the absence of finance, the absence of money is is bad for everybody. But you can also Yeah, have I mean in some money. ways it sounds like it's a it's a story about the creation of money, but it's also a story about the creation of finance. Yeah, money and finance are, uh, I don't want to say two sides of the same coin, but they are uh, very, that would be very- a little on the nose. It would be a little on the nose. They are very close together, right? I mean, you know, banks create money. Like most money in the world is not dollar bills. It's money in a bank account. And when a bank makes a loan, they are creating money that didn't exist before. They're not just taking your deposit and lending out. So banks, finance, and money are, are largely overlapping. And then you say there are times when the real economy and finance get disconnected. Finance lags behind the real economy. And then that's when the trouble starts. That's when you have Great Depression style things. Yeah. So you can, you can again, get in trouble on either side, right? Finance lagging behind the real economy is exactly the Great Depression. That's the people who need a loan can't get it or prices are falling. That's a classic sign. Uh, and then the other side is finance gets out ahead of the economy and there's too much lending, weird, everybody can get a loan, sketchy finance. That's also bad. You need kind of the Goldilocks uh, world, right? You need the just the right amount of finance, just the right amount of money. And tension, right? You say that there, there have to be opposing forces. You can't have like an absolute monarchy in France and John Law running the whole shaboodle. Yeah, I mean, that was that was the really striking thing to me about John Law, right, is I think there's a good argument that he got in trouble, not because finance is bad or because he is bad, but because he had too much power, right? He could do whatever he wanted. And he did go wild. He kept printing more money and the stock price kept going up. And he sort of got into this kind of crazy hamster wheel of finance. And in part, it was because France was a monarchy. The regent basically let him do whatever he wanted. And, you know, if you compare that to, say, America today, like, we have fights over who has what power, right? There are lots of complaints that, you know, banks have too much power or are not sufficiently regulated. There are other complaints that, uh, you know, the government is overbearing and steps in where, where it shouldn't. Uh, and like the argument itself is quite useful. Like, I don't know what the right equilibrium is or at like what margins we need to do what, but the fact that there are these different power centers uh, with finance and with money itself and that, you know, banks are creating money and the Fed is creating money and there's oversight, the government is insuring deposits, this whole web of different people holding power and arguing with each other, it obviously doesn't entirely prevent us from problems. It doesn't solve financial crises entirely, but it gives us a better shot. And I think overall, we're likely to get more stability more of the time when there's sort of competing interests fighting over money. Right. And one other theme that I would say recurs con that recurs constantly is trust. That money is not just a fiction, it's a shared fiction. And that at some point there has to be a character whom you trust to make you whole. Yeah, I mean, a character like, it, you know, in the U.S. today, it's, being, yeah, it's, central the, bank it's the government. Or, yeah, it's basically right. America as a going concern. But yeah, I mean, I think it's maybe more obvious today, right, because our money is backed by nothing. But, you know, like if you think of gold, like gold isn't worth anything. You can't eat it. You can't live in it, right? The, the money part of gold has nothing to do with the goldness of gold, right? It has everything to do with your trust that people are gonna give you stuff in exchange for your gold. And they're gonna give you about as much stuff as they would have given you yesterday or six months ago, right? Like it's that belief, that trust, that is the fiction part, right? Like the metal is just metal. It doesn't become money until everybody believes it's money and trusts that everybody else is gonna think it's money. Yep. Okay, now we are around the industrial revolution. You describe two different economic universes. What happens here? How do we go from like <laughs> fairly simple financial instruments to a changed world? Yeah. So, I mean, that shift is not just finance and maybe not even primarily finance, right? It's, yeah. it's technology, really. It's, you know, um, it's figuring out how to get more stuff, more output with the same amount of work. And so, it is really incredibly dramatic when you look at just a graph and a graph can be dramatic of, you know, whatever GDP per capita, basically measures of like how much stuff could a worker make in a day. And, you know, before the industrial revolution, which happened around 1800, started in England and then it spread, there were these little moments like most notably China around the year a thousand where you had seen these little bursts of productivity gains. But in general, this, 
assumption that we now take for granted that you have technological improvement over time and that that leads to gains in output basically uh, just didn't hold. Like for hundreds and hundreds of years, people didn't get richer and the world didn't change that much. Uh, and then quite suddenly, right around 1800, it starts to change and it keeps changing. Uh, and it, it's, it's the most important shift in economic history, certainly. And it's, you know, it's not intuitive that everybody can get richer, but everybody can get richer and everybody has gotten richer. And, you know, I think part of the issue is for the last, whatever, 40 years, say, there has been this rise in inequality, right? Where the gains, we're still having productivity gains where workers make more stuff every day, fit more valuable stuff every day. Uh, but the gains have very largely gone to to people at the top of the income distribution, to rich people, right? And so it's sort of harder to feel in your bones this idea that everybody can be better off. I feel like there's a really deep intuitive sense that if somebody is getting richer, somebody else must getting poorer. Somebody else must be getting poor, right? This feeling that the world must be a zero sum game. But productivity gains are like the secret sauce that means that doesn't have to be true. Like if you can get some amount of redistribution, which over the long run we definitely have had, everybody can get richer, everybody can have more money. And that's a real thing. It just doesn't feel that true right now. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's actually striking as you read the book to see how many times when, for example, the freedom of paper money is introduced and enables markets or investors enable the invention of the light bulb um, or in China, paper money creates a, a better standard of living. It, it feels... Striking. It almost feels like a political statement, like, wait a second, like you started with out saying, you know, wait, is money an okay thing? Money or maybe is money is actually neutral. Uh, I mean, I think we're better off with money than without it. I mean, if you think yeah. of like right now, like what are the options? If you want to have a world without money, well, you could have like, you could basically know everybody you ever interact with and make all your own stuff and go back to the like rituals of, of gift giving and reciprocity. But in order to do that, you have to just like be totally self-sufficient and hang out with 20 people forever. And like, that's a certain appeal, although I'm guessing it's probably, I'm probably idealizing it and it wouldn't be as fun as it sounds. And anyways, I mean, it's not going to happen. Now? Isn't that pandemic living? <laughs> that you're describing? Pandemic, but no Amazon, no delivery. <laughs> Good point. Um, <laughs> Uh, or the other option, right? If you want to have a big society without money, you could have essentially the government decide what you get you know, you go to work and they take all the stuff you make and then they decide what to give you. And like, I'm definitely out on that option, right? And so in between those two options is money. And so it's like, it's what we got. It's the best option. And then it's just a big question of like, what's the best version of it for now? Right. And that's it. So once we get to kind of closer to modern times, modern money, as you call it, it seem, it's really, it sounds like an exploration of the right way to deploy this resource, which is a topic on which we still don't agree. Let We can start, I think, with, with modern money and David Hume and the idea of free trade, which I found totally fascinating. Yeah, so so Hume, uh, he was a contemporary of, of Adam Smith, right? The basically founder of economics and influence Smith. So that was 1700s. And Hume had this sort of like a toy model of, of basically what became the gold standard. So we're kind of moving into the kind of classical gold standard which comes along in the 1800s. And the basic idea was like, if you have essentially the gold standard-ish, whatever, if you have you know metal money where the, the value of the metal is the value of the money and you have free trade, everything will just kind of flow naturally. You don't have to have tariffs and quotas. You can just kind of let nature take its course, right? It was a very naturalistic uh, kind of, uh, uh, model, even the metaphors he used, he compared it to like water finding its level, right? So you very much these feelings of like nature, it's natural. Um, and that, so metaphor basically that he's using, that metaphor really got stuck in people's brains, right? The, the gold standard gets going really in a sort of big high global form in the 1800s. Uh, England goes on to the gold standard and England was the big kind of center of the economic universe at that time. And the US goes on to the gold standard and Western Europe goes on to the gold standard. And so 
by the end of the 19th century, basically everybody who's anybody is on the gold standard. And that is the period, I think, more than ever, where that idea that we were talking about at the beginning, that idea that people lose sight of the idea that money is a choice. People mistake whatever monetary regime they're living under for it's kind of the natural order of things. The gold standard was peak that. Uh, and you see it in the depression, right? Then the, the big end, the big terrible dramatic end of the gold standard is the Great Depression. And what's happening in the Great Depression is uh, prices are falling, which is like this alien problem to us, but it was, it was a problem. Well, wages are falling, but the key problem in this universe is debts are not, right? You take out a loan and it's some amount of money and wages fall and prices fall, uh, but your debt is the same, right? So you have to, you're, you're getting paid less, but you have to make the same monthly payment on whatever, your mortgage. So people- And that's, to clarify, that's because the dollar- the, the value of the dollar is fixed to gold. Well, that's why they can't get prices back up, right? Yeah. Yes, the, the, the problem is that it's falling. And the notion that you could change the value of the dollar was anathema, right? The whole fundamental thing of the gold standard is the meaning of a dollar is uh, that $20 in some odd sense gets you an ounce of gold every year, decade after decade. That's, that's the, it's like saying, you know, that the meaning of a foot is that it has 12 inches. Like, of course it is. That's just what a foot is. It's 12 inches. Of course, that's what a dollar is. It's $20 and change gets you an ounce of gold. And so finally, FDR comes along and th there are a few economists who are, uh, who are challenging this prevailing worldview who say, look, the problem is, as you said, the gold standard. And what we need to do is get prices back up. And the way to get prices back up is to change the value of the dollar in terms of gold. And FDR starts listening to them, but his own advisors are completely freaked out by the prospect of going off the gold standard. Like, and these are, you know, these are the liberals, right? Like these are the Democrats. Herbert Hoover who lost wouldn't even have broached it, but FDR starts kind of poking at it and his advisors are dead set against it. But finally, FDR just goes against them and he says, we're, gonna, we're going off the gold standard, that's it. And one of his own advisors says, look, this is the end of Western civilization. This is it, like it's chaos now. You know, like they were so embedded in this myth, basically in this story that the gold standard was what money was and that everything else was just some silly thing. Like what, if you can just make up that a dollar that, you know, is not a fixed amount of gold, then anything, what, there's nothing left. But Roosevelt was right, like unambiguously. And you see this in country after country, going off the gold standard was the, was the turn, right? Obviously it wasn't the end of the depression that that didn't come till World War II, but you can just see it as, as clear as day on the charts. Like England had been forced off the gold standard a couple of years earlier, they had planned to return and it never really happened. And they started getting better in 31 when they went off and 33 right before the US went off was absolutely the nadir of the depression uh, because it was the way to get prices back up which was the core problem. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll talk about interventions and then we'll start talking about the uh, the modern, the world in which we live and our increasingly uncomfortable relationship with money and what that might lead to. So these interventions related to the gold standard, the Fed, and you, you really, you know, you address our two big financial crises. We'll get to the one we're in later. Um, 1929 and 2008. In 1929, you say that the central bank, the idea of a central bank, which was created to build trust then breaks everything, makes the Great Great Depression so much worse. Yeah, yeah, so that's going back a little bit. So now Roosevelt's not president yet. Right, right? We're, so pre, we're pre, we're Hoover, in the gold Hoover's standard. Hoover's the right? president uh, and the Fed, right. So the Fed had been created, Fed was not that old yet. The Fed had been created like, oh, less than 20 years earlier. Um, and their job was sort of to manage the gold standard, right? Uh, they were definitely gold standard true believers and so, so, you know, today what the Fed does when the economy is bad is they lower interest rates to make it easier for people to borrow money and kind of stay afloat, encourage businesses to borrow and invest and keep their workers on, which is good. It's basic monetary policy 101. In the gold standard, they had to do the opposite, right? So what happens in the early 30s is, you know, there's this Wall Street crash, but sort of contrary to the some amount of popular belief. It, the crash itself wasn't what caused the depression, right? The, the crash on Wall Street in 29 was bad and it you know, led to kind of a normal recession. 
But then there started to be um, bank failures and uh, there started to be runs on the banks. And then people started to pull their gold even, you know, come and turn in their dollars for gold, pull their gold out of the Fed. And the rules of the gold standard say, oh, well, people are coming to pull their gold out. You know what we're going to do? We're going to raise interest rates, right? Like, let me tempt you to keep your money in the bank by raising interest rates. That way you won't pull your gold out, which makes sense narrowly with respect to gold. But it's the exact opposite of what you want to do in a bad economic moment, right? You want to lower interest rates to encourage people to borrow. Raising interest rates just makes everything worse. It makes it harder to borrow money. Uh, it makes prices fall even more. Uh, and so it was the raising of interest rates by the Fed in the early 30s that turned what would have been a bad recession into the Great Depression. All right. And then we get to, well, I know we're skipping over in time, but we'll go straight ahead to the next, the, to the 2008 yeah, crisis. Not that because, much happens in between. In you know, of money. we'll just Let's like, nah, a yeah, yeah. couple of world We could go to the world 70s war. if you want. Like we could start the, we could start the 2008 recession in the 70s. Well, let's, because that's what's okay. so interesting because it is a tale, like we said earlier, of increasing complexification and. Yeah. And of a new kind of money. And of a new kind of money. Exactly. And this idea that you're imposing rules to sort of control the flow of money. And then that is leading to under unintended consequences. So yes, plant the seeds for the 2008. Exactly recession. right. So, I mean, to your point about imposing rules that actually starts in the depression itself, right? Alongside uh, going off the gold standard, uh, the Roosevelt administration puts rules on banks. So there's uh, deposit insurance, which actually was not a thing nationally before where the government guarantees money in the bank up to a certain amount. Uh, but in exchange for that, and so, you know, when that happens, that's actually an important mo moment too, because that's when money in the bank really becomes fully money, right? Before then, a deposit was like a loan to the bank. And if the bank goes out of business, you don't get it back, right? So before you have deposit insurance, a paper bill or a gold coin uh, is more money like than a bank deposit. But once the government is insuring your deposit, then it's more money like. So in exchange for this deal, the government regulates banks really heavily. And it actually limits the amount of interest they can pay on, uh, on savings accounts uh, and, uh, and on checking accounts. And so in the 70s, these two guys uh, who work in finance have this idea, which is to create something that is quite like a bank account, but it doesn't have that guarantee of the government and it can offer more interest. So they invent what becomes known as the money market mutual fund. Uh, one of them is named Bruce Bent. Uh, he is actually uh, still alive. I talked to him when I was working on the book. And, you know, he was very clear that they wanted it to seem like money. Uh, so when you put in a dollar, it's always worth a dollar. It doesn't sort of go up and down the way stocks and bonds do. Uh, you can take out your money same day, any time. That was a new thing that you couldn't do before. Pretty soon you can write checks on your money market mutual funds. And, you know, these blow up into this huge... Thing. If you have a just like a brokerage account today and you have a little bit of cash in there, that is probably in a, a, a mutual fund, a money market mutual fund. Uh, and, you know, when, when Bruce Bent and his partner started it, it was incredibly safe. So they were taking in people's money, right, bank-like, letting them withdraw at any time. And what they were doing with the money was basically buying very short-term government debt or uh, short uh, time deposits like CDs, you know, government-insured savings accounts, big jumbo government insurance savings accounts bank. So dead safe, right? Government guaranteed, safe, great. But then what happens is these are so popular because it's like, oh, good as a bank account, but more interest. I'm in, right? Uh, they get huge. And there's so much money flowing in that now the funds are looking for new places to lend it, right? I'm putting my money in the money market mutual fund. In order for them to pay me interest, they have to turn around and lend it out somewhere. And what starts to happen is they start to make riskier loans, basically, with their, it's not really depositors' money, but investors' money. Uh, and Bruce Bent, by the way, is anti this. You see him decade after decade complaining to the Wall Street Journal about, uh, you know, all these other funds that are too risky. And he keeps saying, he has all these like little catchphrases, like the purpose of the money market fund is to bore you into a sound night's sleep. And so then along comes the big, uh, Sorry about that one. Along comes the big boom of the early- That's not happening right now, just so you aughts. know. Appreciate it. Yeah. God forbid. Uh, the boom of the aughts and like the untold story of that boom, like we know about, you know, the crazy real estate lending and securitization and all the weird things that were going on. But the 
the money funding all of that weird action and the investment banks was coming very largely from these money market mutual funds. So you and I, and also big companies, we have our boring money market mutual funds, which is the place we put our money that we want to be safe, but that we want to have a little more interest on. And they're turning around and lending it to investment banks and weird conduits that are fueling the non-bank mortgage lenders that are doing all the shady mortgage lending. So then 2008, September, Lehman Brothers, the investment bank goes bankrupt and Bruce Bent, the inventor of the money fund who's been saying how everybody, all these other money funds are being too risky. Turns out his money market mutual fund was lending money to Lehman Brothers, lending money to this investment bank. That's right, that just went bankrupt. And so they don't have, you know, they're bankrupt. The thing that it means when you're bankrupt is you can't pay your debt. So there is this run, it's basically a bank run, even though it's not a bank, on this money market mutual fund because all these people thought their money was safe in there. Suddenly they realize maybe it's not. Everybody goes to get it. Classic bank run, they don't have the money. They've loaned it out and they can't get it the day Lehman went bust. So they can't give everybody their dollars back. A couple of days later, uh, George W. Bush, the president at the time, steps in and says, okay, tell you what, we're actually gonna give deposit insurance to money market mutual funds now. We're gonna make them kind of like banks, even though they never paid in because we'd all blow up if they if, they, if this run continued. And so that, that insurance was eventually wound down, but uh, money market mutual funds persist. There's some increased regulation on them, but they still live in this weird space where they have created this thing that is very money-like, it's not bound by the rules that banks are, and it's still in this kind of gray area. Shadow banking is the catchy name for this. Right. I mean, is shadow banking an inevitability? And pardon me on the dog situation, no, I will great. mute while you answer. Is something like shadow banking an inevitability whenever we're creating increasingly complex systems because incentives are what they are? Yeah, I mean, I think even without the your qualification of whenever we're creating increasingly complex systems, I mean, the thing that happens again and again and again is this new money-like thing gets created. It's a, it's a receipt for your gold at the goldsmith. And then it's a receipt uh, for not actually your gold at the goldsmith, it's just a receipt. Uh, or then regular bank deposits, right, uh, are created and they're like money, but then there's a run on the bank. I mean, uh, I don't think there's really any like binary escape, right? I think the sort of nature of, of money and of finance is that like, we are gonna keep having these problems at some margin. Like there's, you know, whenever anybody says we're never gonna have a financial crisis again, they're either lying to you or they don't know what they're talking about, but you can, sort of turn the dials, right? You can have a lower risk of a financial crisis by changing the rules, basically. And, you know, uh, there are simple things you can do to lower or raise the risk. The trade-off is often the less risk of a financial crisis you have, uh, the harder it is to get a loan, basically, reductively. Uh, but yeah, they're going to persist. There will always be financial crises. How's so the will there always be there will always be something because we'll always create increasingly there. Now someone's going to come and get a, a dog leash because it's, it's Zoom land. The way we um, live now. Yeah, exactly. I think that although you make it very clear why the gold standard doesn't work, there will also always be this question about the IOUs, right? And trust and, and that if you're going to prevent a bank run, shouldn't you just have enough gold in the bank? Yeah. So, I mean, Fractional reserve banking is inherently unstable. And there is, I mean, there's this idea that nobody really talks about now, uh, but that I find very compelling. Uh, and it has like an interesting intellectual pedigree. It actually goes back to the depression and a lot of sort of surprisingly kind of conservative economists, Milton Friedman, for example, like it. And that idea is basically don't have banking anymore the way we have it. Don't have it right. like the goldsmiths did it. Get rid of this sort of fractional reserve part of banking, right? If you think about banks, uh, they are basically doing two different things, right? One is they're like a money warehouse. They're the place where the, you store your money, where you get your paycheck deposited, your ATMs, you do your bill pay. That's one thing. The other thing they do is they make loans. And it's the combining those two under one roof is the fundamental problem that leads to financial crises, right? So what you could do is you could say, okay, here's one type of business. It's the money warehouse where you do all your 
bill pay, you get your paycheck deposited there, you get your APM, your ATM money there. And like you would pay a service for that because they're providing you a service, just like you pay for other utilities, pay for mm -hmm. cable, whatever. That's one thing. And then over here in another business, another company that has nothing to do with the money warehouse, we have our lending. And if you have money that like you have saved and you want to invest that money with the chance of getting more money, you can give it to this lending company and they'll lend it out to people. And if that money gets paid back with interest, you get paid back with interest. And if it doesn't, you lose some money because it's an investment and you're taking risk and there's no free return. And I actually find that model very compelling. Like, I mean, it could, you know, you will always have people who want to creep in and create little shadow banks, like that will never end. But intellectually, at least, just separating lending and deposit taking, it's very intellectually satisfying. It's a very coherent idea, even if politically it seems unlikely to happen. Well, it does seem like in the, in the kind of world of fintech, that in some ways that conversation is starting to occur, right? Like what will be the role of a bank going forward? Well, certainly peer-to-peer -peer lending, which seems to have sort of, you don't hear about it so much anymore, yeah. but peer-to-peer -peer lending is the kind of lending without deposits side of it, right? That's, that's you put your money in this fund and they lend it out to other people. And if the other people pay it back, you get your money back with interest. And if they don't, you don't. Like that is half of the, kind of split we're talking about. Uh, and then uh, I don't know as much. You probably know more about fintech than I do. I mean, is there kind of the money warehouse side of fintech? You tell me. Well, that's kind of what I meant that as we move toward peer-to-peer -to -peer lending and um, institutions that are springing up that are not technically banks, but are saying yeah. like, put your money here and we'll take care of it. And we may invest it, but we'll have it available for you and we'll protect it. That there does seem to be at least regulatorily it's not, you know, a dr as dramatic a shift away from money, but there is the, at least a small inkling of the kind of questioning that John Law might have ended yeah. up Yeah. <laughs> well, or, I mean, the Ant Financial, right, is, is the huge version of this, right? The, yep. the uh, Chinese company spun out of Alibaba. And just in the last few days, there was this big thing where they were going to have this maybe the biggest IPO ever in history. And like kind of suddenly at the last moment, the regulators in China were like, actually don't do that. Uh, it is the case that that, I believe it was Ant, one of the large, uh, you know, the giant Chinese tech firms had their own money market mutual fund that was the biggest in the world for all. I think the regulators pulled them back, but it's still one of the biggest. And when I heard about that, I was like, oh, that's just a bank run waiting to happen. Like we know how that story goes, right? It's like, yeah. keep your money here and you'll get a higher return than at the banks. Because in China, they do financial repression basically and uh, interest rates on banks are, are capped down just like they were actually in the US in the 50s and 60s. And it really felt like a replay of the whole money market mutual fund 2008 financial crisis run. You know, anytime anybody says, give me your money, you can have it back anytime you want and I'll pay you interest. Like something's going on that is, probably going to have some instability built in somewhere, right? There's right. no free said, money. Essentially follow the money, just like uh, in the financial crisis. I will, I want to get to the questions that are coming in in our last 10 minutes, but I will get a lot of angry tweets if we do not at this moment address Bitcoin. Because when you okay. look at the future I don't money, want you, you say, to get any angry tweets. I mean, you'll get them too, man. Okay. Because the Bitcoin people will say, why didn't you, or the cryptocurrency people will say, why didn't you talk about cryptocurrency? But this, you know, decentralization of money seems to have a permanent appeal or that there that's an ongoing tension. Should we centralize it to make it safer or should we decentralize it? And I mean, could there be a bank run on a cryptocurrency? Well, if you have banks, sure. Like it's not the <laughs> cryptoness that makes it runnable or not runnable. It's the bankness, right? If you have maturity transformation of liquidity, if, if, yeah, if you have crypto banks, you could have a bank run in, in crypto. Right. The, I mean, the True. big, you know, so I, I mean, I read in the book about the kind of prehistory uh, of Bitcoin, which is super interesting. There's this like basically 20 years of people kind of trying to solve these technical problems and having this dream of the, you know, anonymous or at least pseudonymous money without any intermediary, right? The like absence of an intermediary is this incredible it is a technological breakthrough, right? Like it's, they solved a lot of hard technical problems and intellectually, it's really interesting to think about like, what is money without any intermediary where everybody sort of shares the ledger where everybody keeps track of everything. I mean, I will say the striking thing to me, a striking thing to me since, you know, 2008 when the Bitcoin white paper was published, uh, 
basically when Bitcoin was invented, is how little people seem to use it uh, to buy stuff. You know, the most basic function of money is it's what you use to buy stuff. And it's been a long time now and people aren't using it to buy stuff. And I know that's like a kind of kindergarten-y view of it, but like not nothing, right? And, and I, I still don't know what the use case is. I mean, evading capital controls is good. If you live in a country where they don't let you take your money out of the country, Bitcoin is clearly useful for that. Demanding ransom if you hack somebody's computer, it's clearly good for that. Uh, but like, it's not happening yet, but it could happen. Like right. one of, definitely one of the lessons of the books is, I don't know what's gonna happen. Well, so, and so far, like so many things, it seems to have become primarily a financial tool. I guess, I mean, it's a betting tool, but if it's a financial tool, I don't know what it's financing. Like it's not yeah, using true. lens. You know what I mean? Like that's- So many Lambos, so many Lambos. <laughs> it is um, definitely, I mean, what, one question is like, are the people who invested in Bitcoin just, you know, riding it up? Are they, do they think it's like gold where it's just has some value because it has value? Do, are they betting on it because they think it will be money that people actually use to buy stuff? I don't actually know sort of empirically how that falls out, you know? Yeah. All right. I'll get to, I want to get to some uh, of our audience questions before we go. How successful has the effort to separate financial calculations from humus bi human bias been? This kind of actually gets into cryptocurrency potentially. I mean, I don't know if I exactly understand the question, but my instinct is to say not very successful. I mean, I feel like human bias, like I'm not sure what calculations they're thinking of. Uh, you know, there's this- It seems like it's a, it's a correction question, right? Like yeah. what, what this like book our is, is sort of an efficient. ongoing story of the effort to tweak. I mean, I'll tell you one thing that, that comes to mind, you know, so Renaissance Capital is this hyper successful hedge fund with like, ridiculous returns over a long period of time. And they were one of the early quant funds, right? So they invest based on, I don't know what, smart things computer people figure out. And apparently they actually, at least in some settings, don't want finance people working there because like the computer basically will say like, this is a good trade. And they don't want people who are like, why is it a good trade? Explain to me what is the story that makes this a good trade? Because like, if you can tell a story, somebody else is probably telling that story already and it's not a good trade. So like that to me is actually the most compelling story of like getting away from human bias. It's like, don't even ask the question, just believe the machine. But in general, I don't think any of us do that except Renaissance Capital and a few other. Things. And do you think it would help or not help if we did just believe the machine? I it think, has bias built in, right? Uh, well, Renaissance has done very well, I will say, for themselves. So I guess it depends on the question. I mean, I don't think we should outsource our human decisions to machines, but this one hedge fund that they, that uses computers has done really well. Um, more and more companies are moving toward, this is our, our relationship with money and transparency. More and more companies are moving toward pay transparency to help remedy the pay gap uh, on questions of inequality. Are there examples in history that support either side of this coin, pun intended? And to build off of that, who even made up the idea that it's inappropriate to talk about money and salaries at work? Yeah, who did make up that idea? It's really interesting because it so obviously gives power to the company, right? Like there's an information asymmetry, like the boss knows how much everybody makes, but everybody doesn't know how much everybody makes. It's wild that that is the norm, right? Like workers seem to me obviously to lose from that. Now there might be some counter argument about like social cohesion and resentment, but I am skeptical of it. There is a Nordic, to, to the other part of the question, there is one of the Nordic countries and forgive me Nordic countries, but I forget which one uh, has a basically uh, public income tax data so that everybody can look up how much everybody makes. And so if you want to go find stories about that, like that to me is the most fun version of like, how does it work? But then again, if it's a Scandinavian company, they, country, they all probably make the same amount anyways, right? So it's like <laughs> nothing to see here. Uh, more questions about the physical underpinnings of money. I doubt gold and silver will stretch today as real wealth commodity money. Is there another useful real wealth final payment money instead of just IOU money? Is that even practical today? I don't think it is practical. Like I, I, I think IOU money is great final payment money. Like I think, I think the gold standard is a bad idea. Like my 
study has persuaded me. And the idea that we need to tie our hands in that way, right? I mean, that's the case for the gold standard, right? Is it right. saves us from ourselves, saves us from our desire to print more money. But I think the cost of that is far larger than the benefit. When did that? You don't want to go back. I kind of want the 40 pound coin. I mean, I just okay. feel like Do it. our legs Do would it. be so strong. I feel like if you carry a 40 pound coin around for a year, that's a book deal right there. <laughs> just, and Let's I try to it. buy stuff with it. Yeah. Go to it's Sweden. like even worse than when you have a hundred dollar bill that no one will take. Yeah. Can you break um, this? Literally. Just can't you? You just, just get a hammer. Bam. When did, this feels like a lovely and somewhat philosophical way uh, to end our audience questions. When did the concept of time is money enter our social lexicon? Oh, I don't know. I could make it up though. If I were going to make up an answer, I would say <laughs> it was uh, the like, I'm going to go with industrial revolution. I was going to go with like 1600s, 1700s when like financial capitalism got going. But really, I think the idea of like the wage and the hourly, uh, you know, hourly pay and even a job as we know it was a product of the industrial revolution. Uh, where you go and you work for a company and you get paid. Before then, people were basically self-employed, whether they were skilled artisans or farmers. And so it was a more, you know, integrated life, right? You worked, basically they worked all the time. Let's be clear, I don't want to idealize it. It was incredibly impoverished and they worked all the time and they was full of pain and suffering. But the idea of being on the clock or on the clock or being on the clock or off the clock didn't exist yet. So I'm going to say making it up, industrial revolution. I love it. I mean, a made up thing is the whole deal today. <laughs> now uh, is the point in our program where there is time for one last question. I'm going to ask it because one thing you note in your writing about the financial crisis is that we should, when we look to the next disaster and, and on any given day, there are predictions that that next disaster is here, about to be here. The stock market doesn't understand. You know, we don't know. Um, you say, look for the place where people are making loans that don't feel like loans, where they feel like money in the bank, which can be withdrawn at full value at a moment's notice. What is the thing that is like a piece of paper from a goldsmith in 1690, a deposit in a bank in 1930, or a money market fund balance in 2007 that everyone's gonna try to cash in at once? If you had to make up another thing, what's well, that Well, is thing? it a cop out to say it's still money market mutual funds? Cause it is. <gasps> It is. Uh, it is. Yeah. I mean, I thought we fixed that. We didn't fix it. And in fact, you know, money market mutual funds are still not bank money. They have a, and yet when the financial, well, it wasn't really a financial crisis. When the pandemic hit this spring and the economic crisis hit, one of the first things the Federal Reserve did was create a facility for money market mutual funds uh, uh, to, you know, help support them. And to be clear, in that moment, that was the reasonable thing to do. The, the time to let you know uh, an institution like that crash is not in the middle of a pandemic, is not in the middle of an economic crisis, which is part of the fundamental problem, right? Like, it's not a good idea to let these institutions crash because they bring us all down with them, which is why finance is special, which is why finance has all these weird things going on with it, because it's money, they're creating money. And like deposits in money market mutual funds are still money-like, even though regulators don't really want to admit it. So it's that. All right, maybe eventually we'll get around to fixing that. Our thanks to Jacob Goldstein, don't hold your author breath. of the book. <laughs> don't, don't. All right. Money, the true story of a made up thing for joining us today. We'd also like to thank, of course, our audience for watching and participating live. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. And I promise you at this point, we have not told every story in the book. There is much more to read. Thanks a lot, Jacob. I'm Molly Wood. Thank you and stay safe, everyone.